Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Millett with an AP World History presentation. Today's presentation is all about networks of exchange in pre-modern world history as we continue through our study of period one, the 1200 to 1450 period in pre-modern world history. In the previous presentation, we focused on the development, characteristics, and effects of the Silk Roads throughout the Eurasian landmass. Today, we take to the seas, as we will be focusing on the Indian Ocean complex, which helped to link up multiple regions of Africa and Asia in pre-modern world history. Like we did with our study of the Silk Roads, I want students to look at the reasons for the Indian Ocean complex to develop and expand as it did in pre-modern times, as well as understand its unique characteristics as a maritime network of exchange. Additionally, I want students to actively seek out parallels and points of distinction in the enabling factors that drove interaction and exchange between land-based routes and sea-based routes. And as we did for the Silk Roads, I want students to understand the consequences of economic, cultural, technological, religious, intellectual, and biological exchanges made along the Indian Ocean complex and their impact on Afro-Eurasian societies before 1450. By the end of this presentation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these three learning objectives. One, explain the causes and effects of the growth of networks of exchange after 1200. Two, explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. And three, explain the environmental effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. The Indian Ocean Complex was a network of pre-modern sea lanes, coastal lands, and ports and trading cities that integrated many coastal civilizations of East Africa, Southwest Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. Yet also included the island civilizations of the Maldives, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. In pre-modern times, the Indian Ocean complex came to include more than just the Indian Ocean, as most seafarers hugged close to the coastline of South Asia to avoid risky weather conditions and piracy. Other major water sources that were included in the Indian Ocean complex were the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Strait of Malacca, the Sunda Strait, the Java Sea, the Sulu Sea, and the South China Sea. The central location of the Indian Ocean complex, however, was the subcontinent of modern-day India. India became both a recipient of great emporia and a disseminator of great goods and resources. This interregional trade network fostered a great deal of travel and exchange of merchants, missionaries, and diplomats in pre-modern times. The Indian Ocean's earliest point of integration was likely during the late foundations period when Indian and Arab seafarers began to traverse the Arabian Sea. Around 200 BCE, in the early classical period, Hellenistic seafarers from Ptolemaic Egypt learned of the wind patterns that the Indians and Arabs had long understood about the waterways of the Indian Ocean complex. The knowledge of the monsoon wind patterns of the Indian Ocean contributed to the increased ability for seafarers to safely and swiftly traverse the Indian Ocean complex. Essentially, between November and February, the monsoon winds blow from South Asia across the Indian Ocean towards Southeast Africa. And from April through September, the monsoon wind patterns shift and they blow from Southeast Africa towards South Asia. 
This meant that seafarers traveling between November and February had best be sailing toward Southeast Africa, or else they would end up shipwrecked. Likewise, if it were between April and September, seafarers had best been sailing toward South Asia, or else they would end up shipwrecked. During the classical period, Mayurian and Gupta, Persian, Roman, and Chinese seafarers took to the Indian Ocean complex. In the post-classical period, the Indian, Arab, and Chinese seafarers would come to dominate most of the Indian Ocean complex. Knowledge of the monsoon wind patterns and recognition of the time seafarers must spend in foreign lands due to those patterns helped to foster great economic exchange, cultural diffusion, and cultural syncreticism. Additionally, technologies and state building, which were all advancing in the post-classical period, enabled seafarers to conquer the Indian Ocean's monsoon winds and the adjacent waterways. One reason for the Indian Ocean complex to become such a highly trafficked maritime network of exchange was due to the emergence and maintained existence of strong kingdoms and city-states in East Africa, Southwest Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Different from the Silk Roads, which were far more controlled and regulated by vast empires during the post-classical period, such as the Mongolian Empire, no single empire ever truly permanently controlled the Indian Ocean complex during the post-classical period. Instead, a political landscape of small but strong kingdoms and city-states tended to control and regulate the coastal regions and the narrow yet vital waterways. For example, between the 11th and the beginning of the 16th centuries, city-states prospered along the East African coastline. These city-states were referred to as the Swahili city-states, since the most common language of the city-states was Swahili. Swahili is a Bantu language that adopted aspects of the Arabic language, making it a syncretic or blended language. The East African coastline and the Swahili city-states were integrated with South, Southwest, Southeast, and even East Asian societies through the Indian Ocean complex. Arab seafarers from Southwest Asia traveled and oftentimes settled in the East African coast. This diasporic merchant community helped to build the Swahili city-states. The Swahili city-states obtained gold, slaves, ivory, and local exotic products from interior African societies and peddled them to Indian Arab, Persian, and Chinese merchants in exchange for pottery such as Chinese porcelain, glass, and textiles such as Indian cotton and Chinese silk. Examples of some of the most prominent and successful Swahili city-states were Mogadishu in current-day Somalia, Zanzibar in current-day Tanzania, Mombasa in current-day Kenya, and Kilwa in current-day Tanzania. As much as these Swahili city-states fostered economic activity, the Indian Ocean complex most certainly helped to foster the growth of these states in the post-classical period. Another example of a region whose divided political landscape was instrumental in fostering economic activity in the Indian Ocean complex was South Asia. More specifically, in the western portion of India, the region known as the Gujarat became a prime location for Indian and Arab seafarers to peddle goods. Geographically characterized by the Katiavar Peninsula, the Gujarat rests to the east of the Arabian Sea, a prominent waterway of the Indian Ocean complex. Initially, Arab merchants from the Umayyad Caliphate's Southwest Asian lands, such as Arabia, Yemen, Oman, and the island of Bahrain, utilized the monsoon wind patterns to travel to the regions of Sindh 
in modern-day Pakistan, and the Gujarat in modern-day India. Eventually, the Umayyad Caliphate conquered the region of Sindh, which enabled even more Arab seafarers to travel to the Gujarat. Since the monsoon wind patterns were seasonal, many of the Arab seafarers, merchant and missionary alike, would have to take up residence in the Gujarat region of India, another case of a diasporic merchant community thriving in the Indian Ocean complex. Culturally, this allowed for the Arab language and the Islamic religion to diffuse into Western India, as many Arab men in the Gujarat region married Indian women and fathered children with them in this second residence. For much of the late post-classical period, the Gujarat would come under the control of the Turkish settled state of northern India, the Sultanate of Delhi. The Sultanate of Delhi held on to the Gujarat region from the early 13th century until Gujarat leaders declared their independence in the 15th century and established the Gujarat Sultanate until its conquest by Akbar the Great of the Mughal Empire in 1573, the Gujarat Sultanate was a prosperous and powerful state that was financed by the economic activity occurring in the Indian Ocean complex. A third example of a region whose divided political landscape and access to maritime trade within the Indian Ocean complex fostered strong state building was in Southeast Asia. More specifically, the Sultanate of Malacca was an Islamic city-state in the current nation of Malaysia, and it encompassed most of the contemporary city of Malacca. The Sultanate of Malacca was established in 1400 and lasted until 1511. Founded by King Paramaswara, a conqueror from Singapore, who traveled south into Malacca and conquered a southern point in the Malaysian Peninsula, the Sultanate of Malacca helped to peddle goods between China and India. Paramaswara and his successor's navy stopped piracy in the Strait of Malacca, which enabled greater safety and frequency of economic exchange in the Indian Ocean complex. In essence, any Chinese seafarer heading to India or in any Indian seafarer heading to China, had no choice but to pay the hefty duty to the Sultanate of Malacca in order to safely pass through the Strait of Malacca. The Sultans retained sovereignty over the region until the Portuguese seized the city of Malacca in 1511. Technology was also a contributing factor to the Indian Ocean complex's increased frequency of travel and exchange. Shipbuilding and design became a major aspect of production within the states associated with the Indian Ocean complex. The dhows were sailboats engineered by Indian and Arab seafarers that were used to navigate the Indian Ocean complex. Dhows utilized a triangular shaped sail called a lateen sail which would catch the monsoon winds and rapidly propel merchants windward. The Dow's Latin sails were also interchangeable in terms of direction, which meant Dow's had great maneuverability in inclement weather conditions. Around 1000 CE, Dow's could hold about 100 tons of cargo and crew. By 1500, Dows were strengthened to be able to hold about 1,500 tons of cargo and crew. Another ship that made its way into the Indian Ocean complex was the Chinese junk ship. The Chinese junk ship was a larger sailboat that employed large sails with battens, which made the ship sturdy and stable in inclement weather, but not as maneuverable as a dow. Additionally, Chinese junks could carry a thousand tons of cargo and crew, making them far more voluminous than any other sailboat in pre-modern world history. Junk ships were used as early as the Han Dynasty, but were utilized even more so in the post-classical period during the Song Dynasty 
prior to the Mongolian period in China, and during the early Ming Dynasty after the Mongolian period in China. The apex of Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean complex came during the early 15th century. The Ming Dynasty, which had come to power in 1368 after overthrowing the Mongolian Yuan Dynasty, spared no expense for financing maritime travel. Ming Emperor Yang Le financed his great naval admiral Zheng He for seven voyages into the Indian Ocean Basin. Zheng He's mission was twofold. One, to reiterate China's pre-Mongolian era maritime trade position in the Indian Ocean. And two, to impress the political elites of the states within the Indian Ocean complex of the Ming Dynasty's wealth, technology, and superiority. However, by the time of the 1430s, the successors of Emperor Yang Le decided to revoke the funding for Zheng He's voyages, and the Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean complex soon disappeared. Zheng He's treasure ships and his other junk archetypes that made up his fleet were the largest and most impressive ships to sail in the Indian Ocean complex in pre-modern world history. His treasure ships helped to diffuse Chinese porcelain, silk, and Southeast Asian spices into South Asia and East Africa. In addition to shipbuilding, other navigational implements helped to speed up the pace of dows and junks in the Indian Ocean complex. For example, the astrolabe, a classical Greek invention that was perfected by Islamic navigators during the post-classical period, enabled seafarers to navigate the open waters. The astrolabe was a technology that was used to determine the location of the sun and other visible stars in relation to Earth and the user's visible horizon. Then, the user could determine the altitude of the sun or any other visible star, and ultimately gauge their latitude position. This would be important for navigating direction and estimating the duration of a maritime voyage. Additionally, the compass, a Han Chinese invention from classical times, progressed into the post-classical period and enabled seafarers to determine direction. Its use of a magnetized needle meant that direction could be read even when the sun was not visible, as in the case of nighttime navigation or during inclement weather conditions. The compass kept seafarers on the correct path to their destination and enabled them to venture beyond the coastline sea lanes. In effect, travel and exchange throughout the Indian Ocean complex led to the expansion of market economies and the development of major trading cities in the Southern Hemisphere. Additionally, the Indian Ocean complex fostered a great increase in local production of crops, luxury goods, and technology throughout Afro-Eurasia. At the heart of the Indian Ocean complex was India. India was a purveyor of great economic and cultural diffusion. The region that was economically and culturally altered the most by post-classical India was Southeast Asia, especially the small states and city-states that formed in modern-day Indonesia, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Granted, these Southeast Asian states were geographically positioned between India and China. While India existed with a divided political landscape, China functioned with a highly centralized and imperialistic state under the control of its post-classical dynasties. This meant that the smaller states of Southeast Asia had the potential to be influenced by such prominent nearby civilizations. As China sinicized much of East Asia, it would be left to India to Indianize much of Southeast Asia during the post-classical period. In spite of the fact that India had no single dominant, unified, and imperialistic state, Indian culture such as Hinduism and Buddhism 
social customs, such as the caste system, goods and economic practices diffused to Southeast Asia immensely. Additionally, Islam, by the way of Sufi missionaries and Islamic merchants, also diffused into Southeast Asia. With little exception, these Indian influences on Southeast Asian states were made through the movement of diasporic merchant communities from India who sailed east within the Indian Ocean complex and then settled into the civilizations of Southeast Asia. Though smaller in size, these Southeast Asian states developed as strong and prosperous states that retained their political sovereignty while existing on the periphery of two significantly larger and domineering civilizations, China and India. India was not just a location that was a creator and diffuser of religious traditions, but it was also a recipient of foreign culture and religion. Due to the travels and exchanges afforded by the Indian Ocean complex, India transitioned greatly in post-classical times. Arab Muslim merchants who followed the monsoon wind patterns and took up part-time residency in the Gujarat region as diasporic merchants helped to diffuse Islam to India. Muslim soldiers, migrants, merchants, and missionaries gravitated to India in droves, so much so that some Hindus abandoned their faith in favor of the spiritual equality offered to all Muslims. Some Hindu Brahmin priests entertained the teachings of the Sufi mystics and blended Hindu traditions with Islamic devotional practices, which became known as the Bhakti movement. In spite of Islam's success in India, it did not replace Hinduism as the dominant religion. However, it was through India and the Indian Ocean complex that enabled Islam to continue to diffuse to Southeast Asia throughout the post-classical period. As we wrap up today's presentation, I want students to consider some parallels between the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean complex. First, do you see any overlap in terms of the enabling factors that led to the development and expansion of these land-based and maritime networks of exchange? What role did states and empires play in these networks? How about the role of large cities? Were technologies important in the development and expansion of both of these routes? How about the goods and resources that were exchanged? Are there any parallels in the cultural and religious exchanges and their impact on societies involved in these networks of exchange? Remember, think like an historian and actively seek out these sort of patterns when studying historical processes throughout this world history course.